seminars about Lugol and JT quantum gravity, holography, and matrix models. Okay, uh, so thank you. So let me first thank the organizer for inviting me to give this talk. So my talk will be about Liouville and JT quantum gravity with a particular emphasis on holography and matrix models. And my talk will be largely based on these two papers that have appeared throughout this year and also some progress. So let me first give you a brief outline of my talk. So I will start by introducing uh, Liouville gravity, and then I will go on with the main part of my talk, which will be the calculation of fixed length amplitudes in Liouville gravity. And in particular, I will focus on the disk partition function, the bulk one point function, and as an application, the study of higher topology, and then the boundary two point function. And then I will provide two different perspectives on these calculations, uh, one of them uh, from a quantum group theoretic perspective, and then a second perspective from a specific model of dilaton gravity. And of course, I will end with some conclusions. So first, as an introduction, uh, as we all know, there have been many very exciting developments in lower dimensional gravity or JT gravity specifically uh, during the past couple of years. So as just a few examples, we have learned about understanding uh, higher genus and multi-boundary amplitudes and that they are very crucial to understand uh, quantum gravity. In particular, they are important to understand very late time behaviors of boundary correlation functions and replica wormholes are very important to explain the page curve and the information paradox. As a second example of some of the developments, uh, there have been, uh, or there has been an exact quantum solution of boundary correlation functions and then their interpretation in terms of gravitational physics and shock waves in particular, and many, many more developments that I won't mention here. So it would be interesting to extend our class of solvable models to find out how generic these lessons are. And the goal of my talk is to discuss a, a specific model of lower dimensional gravity to the Liouville gravity. And I want to discuss the amplitudes and phrase it in roughly the same language as we are thinking about JT gravity at the moment. And I will provide two perspectives, as I already mentioned, uh, well, in the previous slide. I will try to interpret this as a Q deformation or a quantum deformation of JT gravity. And I will also interpret it as a specific model of dilaton gravity with the cinch dilaton potential. But I will come back to that near the end of my talk. So first, let me define what I mean by Liouville gravity. Uh, so my definition, uh, which is the usual definition, is the non-critical string from 2D gravity coupled to a matter path integral, or alternatively, the critical string with 2D Liouville matter and ghost CFT coupled together where the total central charge is zero to cancel the conformal anomaly. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, my action is the sum of Liouville matter and ghost actions. The Liouville action looks like this. So this is the bulk Liouville action. It's parameterized by this parameter big Q, which is conventionally uh, well, called B plus one over B. And the central charge of this Liouville sector is one plus six Q squared, which is bigger than 25. The parameter B is defining the Liouville theory and it appears here uh, in the exponent of uh, the exponential potential. And you can think of this when coming from uh, the non-critical string. Uh, as arising from the conformal factor uh, in the metric. So if you write the full metric as a conformal factor times some fiducial, some fixed metric, then the degree of freedom that parameterizes this conformal factor is precisely this Liouville field. And then secondly, we have a matter CFT. And for most of my talk, I will keep this, or I will not specify what it is. It, it can just be an arbitrary CFT with a central charge less than one. Uh, but there are two particular choices to keep in mind, and I will focus on these uh, at some points during my talk. The first is a, as a time-like Liouville CFT, which you can get by, well, basically analytically continuing the parameters of the ordinary Liouville CFT. And a second example to keep in mind is the Q, P minimal model as a matter sector, in which case you can well, solve this total central charge equals zero constraint to relate the Liouville B parameters to these two integers, Q and P, uh, in this specific way. And this defines what is called and studied for a very long time already, uh, the minimal string. The reason why this minimal string will be interesting is because this one has a matrix model description, which we will exploit uh, for some parts of my talk. And then of course we have the standard BC ghost theory with central charge minus 26. But I will be interested in studying this model in the context of holography. So I will be interested in putting it on a manifold, a 2D manifold with a boundary of fixed length and I will interpret these amplitudes as calculating thermal amplitudes where the boundary length is beta, the inverse temperature. Now for that, we need to understand a bit more about boundary conditions of uh, well, the specific components of the theory, in particular the Liouville piece. And these have been studied already for uh, 20 years by uh, Fatiev, the Zamlochikovs and Teschner. 
So what I've written down here is the Liouville action. So the bulk piece again that I had on the previous slide plus a boundary piece. And this is defining a Liouville uh, theory with an FCCT brain boundary. And this brain boundary is labeled by mu b, which is called the boundary cosmological constant. Now, when viewing the theory as 2D quantum gravity, uh, as I mentioned already, the Liouville field is related to the metric as a conformal factor in this way, which means that the boundary length, the total boundary length of your manifold is given just by a line integral of e to the b phi along the boundary. So when I'm interested in an amplitude that has a fixed length boundary and not a fixed FCCT brain uh, parameter mu b, what I can do is I can do a Fourier transform of my amplitude where I, um, well, I do an integral along the imaginary axis of mu b, the boundary cosmological constant. And then because my boundary piece only depends on mu b times that boundary integral of e to the b phi, this integral brings down a delta function that uh, keeps fixed this boundary length to that parameter l uh, that defines my theory. Um, so this gives you a delta function on boundary length, and this is the definition of, bound, of uh, fixed length uh, amplitudes. Uh, and there is, of course, a simple generalization you can do with this, where you just pick a piecewise constant mu b, and you do a separate Fourier transform for each of these. Then you can get a boundary with fixed length segments L1 up to Ln. Now, so this was for the boundary conditions. Now, the amplitudes that I want to uh, study, they have operator insertions. And uh, the, well, the kinds of operator insertions are the following. They're the bulk and boundary tachyon vertex operators, if I uh, formulate this as uh, in the language of string theory. So I'm interested in amplitudes such as this one, where I have a disk with the number of boundary operators, B1, B2, and so on. They're separated by fixed length segments. And then I have also possibly uh, an arbitrary number of bulk tachyon vertex operators. Now, to be very explicit, I write here the, the explicit form of these operators, which is the standard construction you do in string theory. So for instance, the bulk um, vertex operator, you can view that as a rule, or you can write that as a rule sheet integral of some matter operator OM, an operator in the matter CFT, that is dressed by the Liouville operator e to the two alpha phi, um, where the conformal weight of the Liouville piece is, well, as is well known, alpha times Q minus alpha, and then the matter weight and the, the the weight of the Liouville piece are constrained by this relation. And there's also a gauge fixed way of writing this as is well known in string theory. And you can do a very similar, or you can write very similar formulas for the boundary operators as well, where you pick a boundary matter operator, dress it by a boundary Liouville operator, and they also satisfy this constraint. So these are the kinds of operators that I want to be thinking about in this model. So uh, to, to summarize this, the strategy will be to transform Liouville gravity amplitudes to the fixed length basis. And for simplicity, I will focus on this, on this diagrams that don't have world sheet moduli. And there are only, uh, well, there's only this set of disk diagrams then. So you have the disk partition function, the bulk one point function, the boundary two point function, the bulk boundary two point function, and then the boundary three point function. And I want to reinterpret these, as I mentioned before, as thermal disk diagrams where the total boundary length is beta, the inverse temperature, and they would be separated by Euclidean time differences. Now, uh, during this talk, I will only focus on the first three, the simplest ones of these diagrams, and you, you can take a look at it, uh, the paper if you want to see the details on these other two. So let's get started. The simplest one would be the disk partition function. So I've drawn it here. Uh, and then, well, we can look at the older literature, in particular, again, the paper from Fatiev and Zamlochikovs, and also a paper uh, shortly after by Cyberg and Xi, uh, where they calculated uh, this disk partition function with an FCZT brain boundary, and this is the result uh, they found. So it's a hyperbolic cosine 2 pi s over b, where this s variable is related to the FCZT brain parameter mu b by this uh, Koch transform. There's also some factors here like this kappa. I, I write it out here explicitly, but that won't be important for, uh, for the purpose of my talk. And then we apply our transform, our Fourier transform, to go to the fixed length uh, basis. So we take that amplitude, just apply that uh, integral transform. Uh, and well, if you do that, it's convenient. So, well, in the mu b plane, originally we were along this green axis, which is the, the imaginary axis. It's convenient to just contour deform that into this blue contour, which wraps the branch cut of the integrand here. And if you do that, uh, then this is the result we, you find. And this is a very suggestive result. Uh, this fixed length amplitude is written as an integral over a parameter s, which is the same one as one that appears here e to the minus l times kappa cos to pi bs. So this would be the mu b of s, the FCCT um, boundary cosmological constant. 
and then a product of two sinches, sinch to pi bs, sinch to pi s over b. So this is a very suggestive formula, and I, I will have much more to say about this. So let's try to analyze this a little bit. So I, I write it out again here. Now, the first comment that I want to make is that there exists a double scaling limit of this fixed length amplitude that yields back the JT gravity disk partition function. And on a technical level, this is the double scaling limit you should be doing. You should take the Liouville parameter B to go to zero and simultaneously let the boundary length go to infinity in this particular double scaled way where LJT is kept fixed uh, during this process. So this was uh, already noticed in the, this paper last year from Saad Schenker and Stanford, and we have elaborated a bit on this in our paper. So if, if you do this double scaling limit at a technical level, what you end up doing is that this energy variable, this kappa cosh to pi bs, you can tailor expand it and truncate it after the second term, basically. Um, and then, well, you basically need to do a, a substitution in the integral where s is b times k, where k is finite and b goes to zero. Plug that back in. What you find is the JT gravity disk partition function because uh, one of the singes gets tailor expanded and the other one, well, just remains a singe. And this is uh, the well known disk partition function. So uh, the conclusion is that this Liouville gravity um, amplitude has a double scaling limit that yields the JT gravity amplitude uh, partition function. So now let's go back to Liouville gravity again. As I mentioned, I want to interpret this total length as beta, the inverse temperature. So let's write that amplitude. As a, as a canonical um, partition function from which you can, of course, read off the density of states. And it's a cinch, cinch of an R cosh, basically, in the energy variable. Let us analyze this a little bit. So in the limit where the energy is kappa plus something small, so the, the Laplace transform only ranges from kappa, which is its lower uh, boundary. So if it's kappa plus something small, you get back the JT regime of the previous slide. So in the IR, at small energies, you get back JT gravity. In the UV, you get a modification from JT gravity. The density of states of JT gravity has a Cardi scaling at large energies as e to the two pi square root e. This gets modified into a power law scaling in this model, as you can easily uh, calculate. To get some further intuition into this, uh, it is convenient to, to look at the classical uh, saddle of this Laplace integral to just find, uh, well, the th this would be the black hole first law if you were to interpret this thing holographically, and I will come back to that near the end of my talk. But just at a technical level, if you try to calculate the saddle of this integral, you find this relation where square root e squared minus kappa squared is proportional to the temperature. And in the IR regime, again, which I have defined here, so the energy is kappa plus something small, you get back the JT black hole first law where square root of the energy is proportional to the Hawking temperature of the black hole. But in the UV, this gets modified. And in that case, the energy is proportional to the temperature. So this model is describing something that in the IR is giving you JT gravity, but it modifies it at higher energies. Now, if you think about hol holography, where you have this UVIR connection, this suggests a qualitative change of the boundary region of the bulk geometry. So you don't necessarily expect this to be asymptotically ABS anymore. And I, I will come back to that uh, near the end of my talk, where we will take a look at the classical black hole geometry in this uh, Liouville gravity model. So after the partition function, the disk partition function, let's go to the bulk one-point function, which is the next simplest case. So we insert one of these bulk tachyon vertex operators in our model, so one of these, and then we transform this to the fixed length basis again. So again, we take uh, the, the known Liouville amplitude, apply that uh, Fourier transform, and we get this kind of expression. So I will skip the details, but uh, well, it's, it's roughly the same at the technical level. You get an integral over s, the same kind of e to the minus l times an energy variable. And then instead of a product of two sinches, you get a cosine where you have this parameter p. And the parameter p is related by the alpha label. The alpha label was the label of the bulk vertex operator, was the label of the Liouville piece of that. If you parameterize alpha in the conventional way in Liouville theory, for at least for uh, states, as q over 2 plus ip, then that is the p that appears here. Now, because I will need it in the next slide, uh, let me just mention that you can actually do that integral and you get a modified Bessel function where the, the index is labeled by, uh, well, the label of the operator itself. So it's 2ip over b. And the argument of the Bessel function is the boundary length that we have here. Now, this bulk one point function actually has an interesting application uh, in that you can use it to uh, sort of deconstruct multi boundary amplitudes. And that is what I want to discuss now. 
So let's try to think about multi-boundary amplitudes and let's try to think about the simplest one, which would be the two boundary amplitude in Liouville gravity or the annulus amplitude. So I've, I've drawn it schematically here uh, at gene is zero also. So this was computed a long time ago by Martinek uh, from the world sheet perspective. Uh, and the calculation is, is basically a string theory calculation where you integrate over the world sheet modulus, which is the tube uh, length of this, of this uh, cylinder diagram. And then you multiply the Liouville matter and ghost cylinder partition functions between fixed boundary states. Uh, and what, what was also shown in that same paper is that uh, the transform to the fixed length boundaries uh, can be done and you get an explicit result for ch several choices of the matter sector. So if I now specify to a specific choice of my matter sector, which is a two comma P minimal string, well, the matter sector is two comma P minimal model. And then this minimal string has a single matrix description, which is something that I will exploit uh, in the next slide. Then you can write that answer uh, in this specific way. So this is the amplitude for two boundaries of lengths L1 and L2 at genus zero. Uh, and you can write the answer as an integral over an auxiliary variable lambda, some measure lambda times tange by lambda. And then the product of two of these Bessel case where the, the index is this uh, auxiliary parameter lambda and the argument are the two boundary lengths. So if you remember what I discussed on the previous slide on this bulk one point function, you can read this as two bulk one point functions where the lambda and the P parameter that labels this bulk uh, operator we had on the previous slide are related in this way, where they are glued together by doing this integral over lambda and then including the specific measure for doing that. Now these world sheet techniques, uh, well, they're, they're not usable when you have more than two of these boundaries. But then it is convenient because I have now specified uh, to the two comma P minimal string to use matrix model techniques instead to get access to uh, multi-boundary amplitudes with more than two boundaries. So when you have more than two boundaries, there is a very, uh, very interesting and concise formula that was studied by Moore, Seiberg and Staudacher in the early nineties for the genus zero multi-boundary amplitude. And it reads as follows. So this is the amplitude labeled by lengths L1 up to LN. And given knowledge of some function u of x, which is called the heat capacity of the matrix model, you just need to do some, some derivatives basically uh, and set u equal to one near the end. And then you get the, the exact genus zero answer of this multi-boundary amplitude. Now, what is this u of x? At a technical level and at, at genus zero again, as I well emphasize, um, you, you can, well, it's found by solving this, this sets of equation basically. So if you know rho zero of E, so the gene is zero density of states of this model, which we know, which is this sinh of R cosh of E that we had a couple of slides ago, given this rho zero of E, you can solve this integral equation to find F of U from which you immediately find U as a function of X, plug it in that first formula and you explicitly find these generic multi-loop amplitudes or multi-boundary amplitudes. So that is what we have done in the paper and you can look there uh, for expressions in this uh, particular context. But I want to do something else now. I want to see whether uh, these, these multi-boundary amplitudes have the same sort of uh, deconstruction as we understand uh, in JT gravity where we have single trumpet partition functions being glued together with uh, while Peterson volumes. So I want to see whether this structure persists in this model as well. So what I've done here is I've rewritten this as an, an n-fold integral over lambda parameters, lambda i, where i goes from one to n, I've inserted the same measure again, this lambda times tens by lambda, then this Bessel k function, the same kind that we had on the previous slide, and then some arbitrary quantity that I call v zero n of lambda. Now I use this second line here to basically define this quantity. So this is a sensible way of writing this thing because this integral that's written here is an invertible integral transform called the kulturovich lebedev transform. So I want to read this as defining this quantity here. Now, of course, this is a very suggestive way to rewrite things because these Bessel K functions would be uh, bulk one point functions. We have the same kind of gluing measures here. Uh, so, so this is a rewriting in terms of gluing bulk one point functions uh, to some, some other object here, this V zero N of lambda. And this thing would then be a sort of deformed uh, gene zero while Peterson volume. And because I mentioned this is an invertible integral transform, you can just well, invert it and find a very explicit formula for this phi zero n of lambda, which I have written here. It's written as a number of derivatives on, uh, well, a, a functional basically of u of x. 
is P here or Legendre function. So this is a very explicit uh, function that we know because we know U of X also quite explicitly. And in particular, uh, I want to mention here, so everything was at the level of the field gravity, but uh, well, I've discussed on a couple of slides ago uh, that there is a B to zero limit where you go back to JT gravity. Uh, and I will be slightly more explicit on the next slide, but also here there is a B to zero limit. And in this case, this gives you then an explicit formula for the G to zero uh, while Peterson volume does. And this uh, generalizes a formula that Zugraf wrote in the late nineties to finite size boundaries. So I haven't written out this limit explicitly here. You can find it in our paper if you're interested. Now, uh, so this was all genus zero. Now, higher genus corrections, uh, as is well known, can be obtained through these topological recursion relations from uh, Inar and Orantin. And we have used that, uh, or we have used those to give a generic proof that at higher genus, this VGN of lambda is a multivariate polynomial in the lambda, uh, lambda I squared, just like the ordinary well Peterson vo volumes are multivariate polynomials in the B squared, the, the geodesic length uh, of, of that object. So to summarize this, uh, well, this discussion, uh, at arbitrary higher genus G and for n, boundary, n boundaries, uh, this amplitude can be written in this suggestive way where we have bulk one point functions being glued together we have a generalization of the wild Peterson volumes and we have a specific gluing measure here. So graphically, we can associate this kind of picture to it, which is exactly the same kinds of pictures um, you, you would draw in JT gravity. And I mentioned it on the previous slide, but there is a limit of that where B goes to zero and you need to be slightly careful about the other parameters as well, but you can do it. There is a limit that yields back the Sachschenker Stanford procedure in ordinary JT gravity or in hyperbolic geometry. And as a specific point on this, or a specific comment on this limit, uh, this gluing measure, d lambda times lambda times tanh by lambda, if you track how you should actually scale the parameters to find back JT gravity, you find that this lambda parameter should go to infinity. And then the tanh by lambda goes to one, and this basically goes to, uh, well, d lambda times lambda or db times b, where by this b here, I mean the geodesic length that you use uh, in hyperbolic geometry. So, that, so this factor of B you get by the integral over the twist, for example. So you, you indeed get the, the correct gluing measure from this more complicated thing. So we would like to think of this as some version of, well, maybe in a qualitative level for the moment, as a Q-deformed version of uh, these hyperbolic geometry formulas. But I will come back to this Q-deformation later on in my talk. So, now let's go on with the, the third example, the third amplitude that I wanted to discuss, which is the boundary two-point function. So I've, I've well drawn it here. So I have two boundary operators that I label B, which are again of, these, um, of this form, and they are separated by fixed length boundaries of length L1 and L2. So we, we again start with the Liouville boundary uh, two-point function that was known with fixed FCCT brain segments on both sides. Then we transform this object to the fixed length basis by applying this double Fourier transform basically. And after some contour deformation tricks again, this is the answer you find. So this boundary two point function, it looks like, or it has, it has two integrals, two auxiliary integrals over S1 and S2, a product of two density of states where each density of states is again, this product of two cinches, just like we had for the partition function. Then two of these um, Boltzmann type factors of exactly the same kind as we had for the partition function. And then this last object here, this last object. Uh, so by the plus minus signs, I mean, you have to take the product of all cases. So there are four SB functions in the numerator, one in the denominator. The SB function is a, what is called a double signed function. So it's a special function. And this last object is the thing that couples the S1 and S2 integrals uh, together. Uh, I have also introduced, by the way, this beta M label here is just B minus beta. Um, and it's, well, it's interpretable as a matter label. So if you recall, beta itself was, was the label I, I used for a boundary uh, Liouville vertex operator. And then beta M is B minus beta, which would be the label you would use if I use time like Liouville, for instance, to parametrize my matter operator. So this is the natural matter label to use. Now, it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that this thing again has a JT limit, uh, which consists of taking B to zero and then doing a clever scaling of the matter label beta m, which should scale as b times h, where h is kept finite in the limit. And then you use this, this formula where the double sine function, uh, if b goes to zero, it goes to a gamma function. 
and you find precisely the structure of the boundary two-point function in JT gravity again. So again, this object, this amplitude, has a double scalar limit that deals back the JT gravity boundary two-point function in this case. Now for the, the last part of my talk, I want to give you two different perspectives on these uh, calculations. And the first perspective is, um, well, I'll, I will try to convince you that Liouville gravity has a quantum group theoretic interpretation, which you can think of as a Q-deformed version on, of the way uh, JT gravity is related to group theory. And I will take as an example uh, to illustrate this, uh, just the, the boundary two-point function that we, well, that I had on the previous slide. So I just write it out again here. So this is the JT gravity boundary two-point function. I've written it out a bit more explicit than previously. So I have two K integrals, two times this measure, K times sinh two by K, these uh, Boltzmann type factors, and then this, this bunch of gamma functions. Now, uh, it, it was studied a couple of years ago by, uh, well, I, I did it in collaboration with the, the Ghent group, and then also the Princeton group did it. Uh, we have a slightly different story, but we, we agree that there is a group theoretic interpretation of JT gravity. Uh, and well, the measure and the energies you have in this expression, so the measure is K times sinh and the energy is K squared, they match with the Planchonelle measure and the Casimir of a continuous set of irreducible representations of uh, some modification of SL2R. And if you want to know what I mean by this modification, I, will ref I would like to refer you to these uh, papers. So it's slightly more subtle than just taking SL2R. So that works for the measure and for uh, the energies. But you still have this kind of object here, this bunch of gamma functions, which, which I will call a vertex function. But this also has a group theoretic interpretation. And namely, this entire object is the 3J symbol, uh, well, 3J symbol squared, I should say, uh, where you have two such continuous irreducible representation entries and one discrete lowest weight uh, irreducible representation. And to see how that works, it is convenient to recall this formula for uh, which works for compact groups. Uh, so if, if you take the product of three group representation matrices, these three R of G that I have here, and then you do the integral over the entire group manifold, by definition, this is the product of two uh, 3J symbols with the indices labeled, uh, well, as in the left-hand side. Uh, these group representation matrices, for instance, if for SU2, these would just be the Wigner D functions. So this is, well, this is how it works for ordinary compact groups. Now we have a more complicated scenario here because we have a non-compact group. We don't really have SL2R, we have some modification of it. And we also have constraints on it because we know gravity is not an SL2R theory. It is, well, uh, the Hamiltonian reduction of that, or we need to impose the brown Henau boundary conditions, or, well, there are several ways of stating that. But in any case, uh, let me just mention what this calculation boils down to. And again, all of the details I would refer uh, to these papers. So this group integral reduces to an integral over a single variable that I call x. You, again, you get the product of three of these representation matrices. The one associated to the continuous set of representations uh, turns out to just be a modified Bessel function. And the one associated to the discrete representations is just an exponential function. You can do that integral. And you get, indeed, that particular combination of gamma functions that we had here. So there is, indeed, a group theoretic interpretation of JT gravity, which is basically the BF interpretation uh, of JT gravity, but this is how all of the objects that appear here arise from this um, from this group theory perspective. So this is how it works for JT gravity. Uh, well, I, I didn't fully explain this, but um, you can take a look at the papers if you're if you're interested. Now, my main goal here is to try to convince you that, like, uh, well, that there's an analogous story like this one, but for Liouville gravity. Um, okay. So, well, one last comment I should mention here is that the, the crucial role being played in this calculation is by these Bessel functions here. They are representation matrices in what is called a mixed parabolic basis. And in the math literature, literature they are called Whittaker functions. So now let's go to Liouville uh, gravity. And the claim here will be that Liouville gravity amplitudes arise from a, a constrained version of the modular double of uh, the Q-deformed version of SL2R, uh, and where the Q-deformation parameter is e to the pi I B squared. This is a standard formula where B is this Liouville parameter that we had earlier. So this construction, this this, uh, this object here, has a set of continuous self-dual uh, irreducible representations studied by Ponceau and Teschner and then studied by many others after that. Uh, and for this set of representations, which are labeled by a continuous parameter S, there is a Casimir operator, which you can write as cosh to pi B S and a Plancherelle measure, which is the product of two singes. 
And then again, if we look at our boundary two point function and the Aville gravity, of course, these, these uh, measures and the energies, they precisely match with this Poincharel measure and this Casimir operator. So that's already uh, interesting. Now, what we still need to know is whether this object here can also be interpreted as something coming from a 3J symbol, but of this Q deformed group in this case. What we need for that are these Whittaker functions or these uh, mixed parabolic matrix elements of this quantum group. Uh, and they have been constructed before in the literature. So uh, almost 20 years ago, this Whittaker function, and precisely the one we need, was written down uh, and it has a formula like that. So it's a, some integral with some double sign functions in it. If you were to take the B to zero limit to go back to JT gravity, this just becomes the Mellon Barnes uh, representation of the modified vessel function, which I had on the previous slide. Now, the calculation that we did is we took two of these objects. So we insert this integral twice, then some exponential function for the discrete representation. We do that X integral. And after some trickery, you indeed find uh, this specific combination of double sign functions that we have here. So we can also explain this object here from group theory, but this, this time from quantum group theory instead of the, the usual group theory. Now, just to mention, uh, well, we are currently trying to understand the analogous story for uh, the supersymmetric the case, the n equals one supersymmetric case. n equals one Liouville supergravity has this uh, Q deformed OSP one slash two structure. And we also need that Whittaker function in that case to check that 3J symbol calculation. So this is a proposal we have for it. it. It was not known previously in the math literature, but we have some checks for it. For instance, it has the correct classical limit where the Uville supergravity would go to JT supergravity for which we know how the amplitudes or what the amplitudes look like. And then of course we can correctly predict that, that 3J symbol by taking two of these objects and then a uh, discrete insertion and doing that um, integral over that x variable again. Uh, but this is work in progress, so, uh, well, there's still some details to figure out here. So, uh, in the last part of my talk, I want to give you a second perspective on uh, Liouville gravity amplitudes, and that is as a specific version of dilaton gravity with a specific choice of dilaton potential. So, there is an argument at the level of the action, uh, which was studied by Cyber against Stanford in unpublished work, and we have elaborated a bit on this, and I would also like to refer you to this somewhat older paper where they do a similar trick. Um, and, and the calculation at the level of the action is to write the full action, or to, sorry, to, to write the matter piece of the action as a time-like Liouville piece, for which, of course, you have an action available. And then the sum of these two Liouville actions, you can do a field redefinition, basically, uh, where, you, where you put the, the usual Liouville field and the time-like Liouville field, you pick some orthogonal combination of new fields, rho and big phi here, plug those in the action, you get a simplified action that looks like that. Uh, and then if you interpret that new field rho as um, such that e to the two rho is a conformal factor of some metric, then that first term, you can just write it as square root g Ricci scalar times big phi, and phi gets the interpretation now of a dilaton field. And then that second term is entirely just a dilaton potential, which reduces to a hyperbolic sine function. So you get a dilaton gravity model with a hyperbolic sine function for which, because there's a factor of B here, the small B limit for which uh, this sinh just becomes a phi again, becomes linear in phi, you get back to JT gravity as we have shown uh, quite explicitly for the amplitudes during, uh, well, all of my talk up to now. So this is an argument at the level of the action that uh, Liouville gravity, if, if you rewrite the variables, basically, uh, you can view this as a dilaton gravity model with the sinh dilaton potential. Now, we don't understand this argument sufficiently, at least uh, for, for, or when we have these boundary operator insertions, we don't have a full understanding. So instead of trying to, um, well, understand this argument better or make it more rigorous, I will give you two pieces of circumstantial evidence for why, I, for why we believe Liouville gravity should be viewed as a dilaton gravity model with a sinh dilaton potential. So the, the first piece of circumstantial evidence is by looking at the classical geometry. Now for a generic dilaton gravity model, which you can write like that, uh, up to diffeomorphisms, the general classical solution can be written in this way. So this was nicely uh, summarized by Witten in a very recent paper, uh, where the metric is uh, characterized by this function A of R, which is just an integral of the dilaton potential. And the dilaton itself is chosen, well, just linear is chosen to be linear in R. And this geometry describes a black hole uh, with a horizon at R equals RH. 
So up to diffeomorphisms, the general solution can be written in this way. And moreover, you can write uh, the relation of the black hole energy with, uh, as a function of the Hawking temperature very explicitly in this way. So for any choice of dilaton potential, you solve or you do that integral and you get the relation between the black hole energy and the Hawking temperature. Now, if we choose the dilaton potential to be this hyperbolic sine function, we plug that in here, you get a relation, a black hole first law, which is square root E squared minus kappa squared equals Hawking temperature divided by B squared. And this precisely matches with this first law we derived earlier from the, the semi-classical regime or from the thermodynamic approximation from our disk partition function. So if, if Liouville gravity can indeed be written as a dilaton gravity model, it has to be one with this specific dilaton potential. I think this argument shows that. And indeed, now we have a classical uh, solution. And if we look at that black hole explicitly, so I, I haven't written it out extremely explicitly, but you can imagine what it looks like. Then deeper in the bulk, if, if R is sufficiently small compared to the scale set by B, we get back in the JT regime and we indeed just get the classical JT black hole, but it gets modified as you go further, as you go closer to the holographic boundary. Now, as my last piece of uh, sort of circumstantial evidence for the relation between Liouville gravity and Singe Dilaton gravity, uh, I want to briefly mention, uh, well, this comment here. So it is well known that you can write the generic to the Dilaton gravity theory um, in its first order formulation as what is called a Poisson Sigma model. So I've written down the action uh, here, which is determined in terms of this Poisson tensor, this P of X, which encodes this dilaton potential in one of its components, as you can see here. Now, while well, this has been well studied in the past, and in particular, this has a, a symmetry algebra that is nonlinear. I've written it out uh, schematically here. And in particular, the nonlinearity arises because of this dilaton potential that can be arbitrary. It just appears on the right-hand side of a commutator uh, of two of these generators. Now, this, so this is for a generic 2D dilaton gravity model. If you now focus on some particular examples, so for instance, the simplest case where V of phi, the dilaton potential is just zero, this algebra is linear again, and it's just a 2D Poincaré algebra. This is just flat space JT that you get. If V of phi is linear in phi, this algebra is again linear, and you get the SL2R algebra, or you get the ADS version of JT gravity. But if the dilaton potential is a hyperbolic sine function, this algebra is nonlinear, but it is precisely the, the Q-deformed version of the SL2R algebra, or the SL2R group. So what we get from that is that dilaton gravity with the cinch potential is closely related, or it has a symmetry group coming from the Q-deformed version of SL2R. But we already found throughout this entire talk that Liouville gravity itself has precisely the same structure in its amplitudes. So this is sort of indirect evidence that the Avil gravity and uh, singe dilaton gravity are related to one another. So let me conclude. Uh, so throughout my talk, uh, I have investigated fixed length amplitudes of the Avil gravity uh, with the goal of extending our class of solvable 2D gravity models. And I have tried to phrase this in, a, in the same language as we have come to understand JT gravity. Uh, I have also used matrix model techniques to calculate these multi-boundary amplitudes. And some of the lessons we have learned is that these amplitudes have a B to zero limit uh, where they match onto JT gravity amplitudes. The amplitudes display quantum group structure. So there's a Q deformation of the group theoretic structure of JT gravity at play here. And they correspond gravitationally to an exact quantum solution of a dilaton gravity model with a singe dilaton potential. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, Shashiari, go go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe okay. Um, uh, so I just uh, thank you so much for the talk. I just had a small comment about um, uh, the quantum group. So it's well known that uh, the quantum group uh, only has finite dimensional representations when the parameter Q is a root of unity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering if that, uh, so when Q is a root of unity, does that play any particular role in your theory? No, uh, but, um, so okay. Page 17, when you wrote down the Q parameter, it was uh, E to the pi i b. Pi i b squares, yes. Yeah, is b, maybe b is always a rational number, so you're only in that case. Um. 
Well, I'm, I'm not necessarily restricting myself here to, for, or for at least for this calculation, uh, to the minimal to the minimal string here. So B can be anything. So yeah, I think I I, do, I don't see any particular problem with Q being um, a root of or a rational root of unity. Uh, no, it will not be a problem. It will be desirable. So that would, uh, special things will happen because you only yes. get finite dimensional but representation. Is that is that not for compact groups though? Uh, no, it's true for uh, UQSL2 as well. Okay, I see. Um, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything special happening in these kinds of amplitudes, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. It would, it would, yeah I agree, it would be interesting to understand. <coughs> Thank you. Greg? Um, yeah, there's, there's another class of models where uh, we know a lot of results about macroscopic loop amplitudes, which is the C equals one, when you couple a loop of gravity to a C equals one model instead of a minimal model. Yes. Have you thought about doing uh, analogous calculations and finding a quantum group interpretation? Um, well, so, so some, of the, some of the calculations we have done should have a limit where, where C goes to one, basically. Um, but we haven't done it. Explicitly. Oh, that's not a good limit to take. You should. Work. Yeah, yeah. That, I, that, I, that's a very dangerous thing to do. I, I, I agree with that. Many amplitudes look like they become singular and so on. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. So we haven't looked at that explicitly. Now there has been a paper from um, Panos Betsios and Olga Papadulaki, I think, where they explicitly investigate the C equals one model from this uh, from the same perspective as we understand. JT gravity now. They don't do these calculations that we do. Um, uh, yeah, but, but they do some, they, they do some things uh, with that with the C equals one model in this uh, new language. Henry? Yeah, um, so you might think that if instead of considering the two comma P minimal models, if you consider three comma P or some other comma P, mm -hmm that you might get uh, something like JT gravity plus matter. But yeah. that theory has uh, divergences. So, but presumably for finite P or whatever, there are no divergences in uh, the minimal strain. So could you comment on, uh, have you thought about that or understood well, that a little bit better? Not, not really. So we restricted to two comma P because that one has a single matrix model description and that was easier to use, of course. Um, yeah, so we, we haven't explicitly thought about these other kinds of models. Um, can you elaborate what you mean about this UV divergence? Yeah, if you just couple JT gravity uh, to CFT, well, I guess Saad Schenker and Sanford and other people also comment on this. You get the, just even at the level of the um, connected uh, two point mm -hmm. function, the Z of beta, Z of beta prime, you mm -hmm. get a divergence from. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now, well, some, some of these things are definitely better behaved when you go to the Liouville gravity, like the unoriented, um, the, the cross cap calculation, that, that one works fine in, 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 in the Liouville gravity language. Uh, so, so yeah, I, th I think that was mentioned in the Stanford Witten uh, paper as well. Yeah, I think this is, well, this is just the divergence when B goes to zero because you get a tachyon mm -hmm. divergence essentially. Yes. Um, but I mean, it would just yeah, be, okay. yeah. Well, I ha we haven't explicitly studied other. So, so most of the things I said work for any matter sector, except where I needed uh, the, the matrix uh, model description for these multi boundary amplitudes. For that, I, we really specified to the two comma P, where P is an odd number, um, a minimal, minimal string. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's say for the Ising matrix model or something, presumably could also be done uh, where you have two matrices. Yeah, yeah. We, we haven't, yeah, okay. It, it would yeah, be thanks. interesting, but we Sorry. haven't. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a question. So in the case of the flat space JT gravity or the ADS JT gravity, we understand these groups as uh, a symmetry of the, the metric. Uh, they are not quite a symmetry of the dilaton, but they're a symmetry of the metric. And then uh, it, it's well, it's somehow a gauge constraint of the theory, right? Yes. Um, 
how, how can we understand the this quantum group structure? Is, is it, uh... Yes, I, I I don't know. This is this is you know, I I have mainly presented this sort of as an uh, observational. Uh, uh, thing where, where we simply notice that these things are governed by this Q deform, and it's of course no coincidence. Whenever, whenever you have the field theory that this um, this Q deformed version of SL2 arises, but I don't know how to understand that from a geometrical perspective. That, that is probably the the yeah one of the big questions we still have on how to understand this from a geometric perspective, and what happens uh, holographically speaking to the near boundary regime, because it seems like this deformation of JT gravity is modifying the region close to the boundary and it's doing it in a very drastic way and we, we yeah it, it would be interesting to really understand better what's going on even just at the classical level because it seems like we have the answers for amplitudes at the quantum level but we, we don't really know fully what we are actually calculating as quantum corrections to, to some classical calculation at the moment. Did, didn't you discuss classical solution just a moment ago? Yes, 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 yes. So that, I, th I think that is a, like the beginning, but this, there are confusing things about this. For instance, so we do have a classical black hole solution, but if, for instance, you would compute the Ricci scalar of this black hole, so the Ricci scalar, uh, well, it goes like uh, the derivative of the dilaton potential generically, um, and close to the boundary, the dilaton potential and its derivatives are blowing up. So the Ricci scalar is blowing up at the boundary. So, yeah, I, I would like to understand this boundary better. Well, the, I, the I would, I would examples be... of ADS-CFT where Ricci scalars blow up, right? Sorry? Um, there are examples yeah. of ADS-CFT, well, no, it's not ADS-CFT, but examples of holography, let's say, where yeah. the Ricci scalar blows up when you go near the boundary. For example, oh. the metric dual to D2 brains or... The, the one brains. I see. Brains. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I was thinking more that this this might be. Um, well, everything seems Q deformed. So, and there, there have been studies of Q deformed uh, Firazoro algebra. Um, so, so whether this this boundary can be viewed as a Q deformed version of the CFT itself. But, yeah. uh, but I I don't know. If, um, okay. Thank you. Akash. Yeah. Um, hi, Thomas. I had a question, a uh, slightly technical question, which was like, uh, so uh, you choose a particular normalization. I think it, in, for your story, it was important that you choose a particular normalization for the matter, uh, for yeah. the matter insertions that sort of cancel. And so that basically they don't play much of a role, right? Uh, well, I have ignored the matter part and, and the ghost part as well throughout most of my talk because they don't participate in the yes. transform to the fixed length basis. So they would just appear as overall prefactors. And in particular for the amplitudes that I uh, discussed here, this doesn't matter. But when we would go to higher amplitudes, like the boundary four point function, for instance, exactly, yeah, yeah. then yeah, they would exactly. be important that they would, because of the integral over the modular parameter, they would yeah. mix up. And then, then we would yeah. really yeah. So do you, do need you to have specify. a consistency? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And, go ahead. Yeah. What, what do you mean so by? Do you have a consistency check for the for the normalization that you use? Let's say for when you compute the boundary four point function. Well, but the bound, we haven't computed the boundary four point function. That that would be interesting, but it it, it looks hard. But that would be something where right, we definitely right. would be interested in, because that will yeah. be sensitive to the matter sector, like you. Uh, yeah, like you also yeah, but, mentioned. And uh, there's also the fact that you cannot gauge fix the boundary vertex operators in that case, right? Uh, so you yeah, have but yeah, precise, precisely, that, precisely. That's the single modulus, yeah. the, the yeah. cross ratio that you need yeah, to integrate yeah. over. And then the full amplitude right. is not just the product of a Liouville piece and a matter piece. And that, that, that will complicate things. Um, right. Right. So right. Right. we so have. Is it, is it, do you expect that it would still work out? In that case, I guess the matrix, the matrix theory, I, yeah, analogy I sort think, of uh, that. That's the only reason why you would expect that. I yes, mean, yes, it's not clear at all a priori. Yes, yeah. we yeah. we expect that it would still work out, but um, well, in the JT limit, it's unclear a priori what you would expect. And um, because, for instance, when you have four boundary operators, you can have uh, non-trivial things happening in the bulk. Uh, for instance, if you think of these boundary operators as being connected by Wilson lines, you don't have well, they don't necessarily have to split up in uh, Wilson lines connecting pairs of right. operators. You can have a very non-trivial interaction yeah, as exactly. well. And yeah. that's that's what we expect generically. So it, yeah, so, I, I would be very interested in doing that calculation, but it, it looks hard because, yeah. 
it, it looks like a hard cap. So, so do you expect the like a sum of all those calculations where you have like a both yes, yes. Like time ordered uh, or two and, yes, S, as well S, as like a four point in, a vertex in the bulk? Yes, S T and U channels summed over. Uh, yes. I see. I see. Okay. Well, that's what we, we expect. We have some vague arguments, but yeah, it, it would be interesting to understand that better. Definitely. I, I do want to mention that I did discuss one example where we do integrate over the world sheet modulus, and that was uh, this, this two point function. I mean, two, two boundaries, the two boundary amplitude. That one explicitly had that integral over the, uh, the world sheet modulus that, well, Martinek did in, in his paper a long time ago. So, so that shows that indeed you need to do those integrals over those world sheet moduli, and they give you something after you do those integrals that looks similar in structure to the way JT gravity works. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Thanks. Any other question? I have another question. So. Uh, th there was a paper by uh, Bert Kuz, Navroblansky, and others uh, talking about uh, some QD form version of SL2 in the some double scaling limit. Yes. SYK. Is, is this related to what you're discussing? Or it's, it's, an, it's another Q deformation. Okay. So uh, uh, the, the way we understand is at the classical level, SL2R and SU11 are the same group. But if you Q deform, you go in different directions. And in this case, uh, we need the Q deformation of SL2R. And in their case, it's SU11. And you can see it very explicitly in their formulas because they also write down expressions uh, like, these, um, like these gamma functions that we have. Uh, like these things, these sort of vertex functions, they have them as well. And they also, they look like Q deformed versions, but they have gamma Bs while we have SBs. So they're, they're sort of different uh, Q deformations of the same classical object, but it would be interesting to learn if there is, if there, you know, if there is some link or if we can learn something deeper about why one of these would seem to Q deform in one direction and the other uh, seemingly in another direction. But but yeah, but we don't understand that. I have a question. I, I somehow can't raise my hand on Zoom. Uh, so the question is uh, about finite cutoff JT gravity. So you, here you you manage to take, I mean, take different, take a particular limit where the where the boundary length was in was going to infinity in JT mm -hmm. gravity. Can you also set it scale it so that it becomes finite cutoff? I'm not I'm not sure. That would be interesting. Um, yeah, well, it, it would definitely be interesting because the, the UV region here gets modified from JT gravity. So presumably then uh, with the TT bar deformation, if you go back in, you should get back to JT gravity. It seems like you're sort of cutting off precisely this deformation piece again, the, the way in which this thing differs from JT gravity. But we haven't tried to do it at a technical level. But yeah, yeah, I, I agree that would be an interesting thing to think about. Okay, let's uh, thank Thomas again and we'll remain.